Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. I want to start out this morning with a cute little joke. I happened to see it on Facebook. If you've seen it, uh, you'll get to listen to it again. But about this, and the reason I'm going to do it is because I can identify with it. It's about this couple that uh, the man forgot his wife, forgot their anniversary. And uh, she got real upset with him and said, okay, buddy, said, since you forgot next Saturday, there better be something sitting in my driveway that goes from zero to 200 in six seconds. So next Saturday morning, she gets up and looks out in the driveway and there's a package sitting out there and she runs out there and opens it and it's a set of bathroom scales. Zero to 200 in six seconds. I don't think they were on the same track. Anyway, the article said he's still missing. Uh, it wasn't quite what she had in mind, I don't think. You know, weren't on the same track. But talking and thinking about the religious world today, not everybody's on the same track. Sometimes the people talk about one thing and, and it, it means something else to someone else. And, in our lifetime, we have uh, to deal with things. I, we, the time changes twice a year, doesn't it? And we have to deal with uh, either an hour less of sleep or an hour more of, of daylight. And, and I think we have a, a good time with it. And for the most part, we adjust to it. But uh, it takes us a few days to get over change because we're not on the same track. And I. Uh, I think we like getting a little extra daylight more than we like getting a little extra darkness. Uh, there's been a lot of studies done and, it, and we're more productive and feel better in the daylight than we do in darkness. And so it seems to be and put people in a, letter, in a better mood when there's a little more light. I know that during the winter months, when days are shorter, it's a proven fact that there's a lot more depression in people than there are in the summertime when there's more light. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about light. Uh, we talked a little bit about, touched on it this morning in class, and I told Al that I was going to actually speak on this subject this morning. But the Bible has a lot to say about light, and it turns out that there's over 500 passages in the Bible that talk about light. Uh, needless to say, we're not going to talk about all of those this morning because we couldn't get them in today and tonight and tomorrow either. But we're going to touch on a few of them. Uh, I want to spend a few minutes looking at some interesting passages and, and talk about the light. And then we'll look at how we can compare what the Bible says to, to our life and incorporating those things in our life. <clears throat> First, there is a, a hint of the importance of light in the fact that it's mentioned in the very first paragraph in the Bible. In Genesis 1, uh, after God created uh, the heavens and the earth, and it says the earth being without form and, and void, on day one, God spoke uh, one of the statements that's probably the most familiar in the whole Bible. It says, let there be light. And what makes it even more astounding is that... Uh, in Genesis 1, 3 to 5, it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So the very first day, he said, Let there be light, and they divided the, the night from the daylight. Well, as it turns out, it gets a little more interesting because God didn't make the sun and the moon until day four. So where did the light come from? Well, God has always been looked at as being the light. Genesis 1, beginning with verse 14, says... And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons, for the days and years. And let them be for the lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. This was day four. Uh, it's, so we have two different sources of light here. Day one, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And day four, God created the sun and the moon. Uh, so for three days, light existed before the sun and before the moon. And 
there's a hint that there is something special about Lot. And as I said before, there's over 500 passages in the Bible that talk about Lot. Uh, this has posed a problem for a lot of skeptics and, and scientists because their theory is that Lot has always uh, been from the sun and the moon and Lot doesn't exist other than that. But the Bible says that on day one, God created the Lot. And day four, he created the sun and the moon. Uh, I think if we as Christians admit that with God all things are possible, then there's not a problem at all in realizing that God created light separate from the, the moon and the sun. The book of Revelations tells us that in heaven there will be light and it speaks nowhere of there being a sun and a moon. It's going to be day all the time. It's going to be light. Revelations 21 uh, I'm sorry, there you go, in verse 23, it says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is a light thereof. So, you see, it's going to be day in God's kingdom. There's going to be no need for, for uh, the sun and for the moon. There'll be no darkness. If uh, God is enough light for His kingdom, He certainly was enough light on day one for the earth. Uh, it's not hard to understand. And Revelation 22 and verse 5 says, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them the light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So if the Lord will give the light for His kingdom, He certainly could give the light for this earth for, for three days, independent of the sun and the moon. Uh, I, I think back when God was sending the plagues uh, uh, on Egypt, one of the plagues demonstrated God's mastery over uh, light and darkness, if you will. The ninth plague was the plague of darkness. He, he brought total darkness over the land. Uh, Exodus 10 and verse 23 says, They saw not one another, neither rose away from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Well, God provided them light, but no one else was able to see light for three days. There was total darkness. Uh, in God, all things are possible. Uh, a little later on, as the Israelites were leaving Egypt, God gave them light miraculously. Over in Exodus 13 and, and verse 21, it says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of, of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light and to go by day and night. In the New Testament, when Jesus was transfigured uh, on the mount, uh, it was witnessed there by Peter, John, and James in Matthew 17 and 2, and it says, uh, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. So there is a certain connection when you talk about God, when you talk about deity, uh, to the light. Uh, it's brightness. Uh, a very similar terminology is used to describe the angel who came and rolled back the stone to reveal that Jesus, Jesus was risen from the tomb. He was risen from the dead. Matthew 28 and 3 says, His countenance was like lightning and His raiment white as snow. Speaking of this angel, uh, when Jesus appeared to Saul on that road to Damascus over in Acts 26, uh, what it says is that at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining about me, uh, them which journeyed with me. Now I want you to notice that it says above the sun. Uh, not the sun, but away from the sun. Uh, beside the sun there was a great light. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why perse persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. For one to experience such a happening as this, to be able to witness and to see uh, this light that was independent of what we get from the sun or what we get from the moon is something that's astounding. Uh, it was a pivotal event that 
established Paul as an apostle because he saw the light. He spoke with Jesus firsthand. It just demonstrated uh, that he was an apostle and Paul wrote later uh, as born out of due time because he wasn't one of the original apostles who saw Jesus after the resurrection, but he saw Jesus uh, through this great light uh, after the fact, after the resurrection. Uh, and I want to look at a very interesting passage over in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, beginning with verse 15. It says, which in his times he shall show who is blessed and only potentate the king of kings and lord of hosts who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto whom no man hath seen nor can see to whom be honor and power everlasting what does it mean that god dwells in the light and no man can approach well does that mean that we could never approach god never get close to god no, I think what it means is God is perfect and man is imperfect. You know, there's a barrier between man and, and between God. We could possibly get into some very deep speculation, but we could only speculate what it says without any uncertainty. Einstein's theory of relativity says that there is something special about life. That's the whole purpose of his theory of relativity. And, and at one time in his life he was at a social gathering and he was asked professor uh tell me a little bit about your theory of relativity and he said well i will just to make it simple he said it's like when you sit next to a nice girl for two hours and you think it's only been uh a couple of minutes or then you put your uh, finger to a hot coal for just one second and you think it's been two hours. Uh, and he referred to light and relativity as being a subject to the person's mind and, and to what uh, one supposed it, it is, is. I don't claim to understand the scientific theory about relativity, but it theorizes that if a person could travel the speed of light, that time would stand still and mass would be infinite. Well, it sort of sounds like an eternal and infinite nature of God to me. Uh, I don't think that we could, mankind could ever travel the speed of light, but I certainly think it's within the power of God uh, if he wanted to make things stand still. And since it might take an infinite amount of energy uh, to travel at the speed of light, that God is the only one who could ever do it. Uh, I don't think we'll ever reach that point. Uh, we as human beings can speculate about God's dwelling in the light, which no man can approach and what it means. But I think what it means is that we're separated from God because we're man, we're flesh, uh, God is spirit, so we are separated from him. And uh, we're physical and we have physical limitations. God is spiritual and has absolutely no limitations. But we can learn some valuable lessons about uh, the different ways that the Bible uses and talks about light. Uh, we deal with light every day in our lives. We deal with darkness every day, uh, every night in our lives. It's used to describe, though, uh, someone who is an inspiration to someone else uh, many times in the Bible. Over in 2 Samuel chapter 21, one, David is an aging king, king at this time and he's still trying to go into battle with the army uh, of Israel against the Philistines and he, he was nearly killed in this battle and he's getting older. Uh, 2 Samuel 21 uh, beginning with verse uh, 15 says, Moreover the Philistines had yet war again with Israel and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines and David waxed faint. And Ishbanab, which was of the sons of the giants, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But uh, Abshah, the son of Zuro, uh, secoured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle that thou quench not the light of, of Israel. They thought of David as this light 
of Israel. They thought of him as something special. And what I was getting at is in the Bible, in the Scripture, light has always been used as something good, whether it portrays a, a man or whether it portrays God. David was such an inspiration to his man that for him to have been killed in battle would have been a severe emotional blow uh, to his man, to, to the nation. It would quench the lamp of Israel, it says in the Scripture. Psalms 21 and 7 uses light to describe how God uh, protects us and gives us courage. It says that the Lord is my light, my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength in life, of whom shall I uh, be afraid? Uh, in Matthew 4, when Jesus went to Capernaum, verse 16 says, The people which sat in darkness saw great light. So you, you see that it is portrayed always in a good way, whether it's talking about men, whether it's talking about the Son of Man, which is Jesus, whether it's talking about God. It's always portrayed as something good. It's referred to as a good influence sometimes. Matthew 5, beginning with verse 14, says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Philippians 2 and 15, it speaks about the blameless sons of God who are to shine as lights in the world. You know, every time that the word light appears and is spoken about in the Bible, it's about something good. Not one time it does it ever refer to anything negative or to anything that's bad. Uh, in 1 Peter 2 and 9, it talks about those who were called out of darkness and are called into God's marvelous light, being special people, being that they're Christians. The Bible uses the idea of light to teach about our influence and, and what we leave as a legacy, so to speak. Uh, Proverbs 13 and 9 says, The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. Uh, which indicates what we do in life is going to outlive us. You know, our examples and what we stand for and how we live our life in this life is going to be here long after we're gone. I know that you've probably had friends and relatives and dear people that you know that were in the church for years and done great things, and when they're gone, you just don't forget about those things that they did. You don't forget about the lives that were dedicated to God and what they stood for and, and the good things that they did. Those things live on. Uh, it's because they were in the light and they were done in the light. Uh, the important thing for us all to remember is that we are building something as we go through life. We are. Each and every one of us are building as we go through life. What are we building? Well, we're building a reputation. We're building a, uh, something that people can look at and look to. Again, in class this morning, and if you're not coming to class, we're touching on some good subjects. So uh, come on and join in class. But we, we talked about sometimes we as Christians are the only Bible that someone else gets to read. You know, that. let's face it. Not even every Christian opens his Bible and reads it as he should. So can we expect everybody else in the world to, to open their Bibles and read and study it? No, we can't, and they don't. And so a lot of times what they see is the, the examples from other Christians and from other people, and they think, well, they, they're living a godly life. That must be what I need to do, or, or I want to be like that. You know, they're always happy, and they're, they, they're jovial, and they're talking about God, and they're uh, inviting people to church, and they love to get together fellowship with one another they see those examples so what we're building as we go through this life is not going to disappear when we leave they're going to keep going what we built is going to last for a long long time something we just need to stop for a minute and, and ask ourselves is what are we really building on? What, what are we doing? If we're not building that legacy, if we're not building those examples on the light, on God, what, what's, it, what's it all for? You know, what we need to be leaving and what we need to be doing is building something that's going to be around for a while that people are going to not soon forget about the good. And that's what the light is. It's always referred to something as good. Uh, are we just living for ourselves? Are we living uh, a life that will uh, 
burn on after we're gone. And hopefully that's what we're doing. We're, we're just building on uh, what's going to be here after we're long gone. And let's face it, every day that I grow a day older, I realize that <clears throat> I'm a day closer to the end of my life. I'm not going to be here forever. Uh, God didn't make me and create me <clears throat> and put me on this earth to, to live here forever. Uh, and then we don't like to talk about death and we don't like to talk about those things, but we're all going to face it at some point in our life. But it's what we leave behind uh, that makes a difference. Uh, if we're a Christian and we build on that foundation, it, we may be the only Bible that some people get to read. Uh, the Bible also uses the term light <clears throat> to describe God's truth. So if we take the Word of God, if we take God's truth and we incorporate it in our lives and we leave that le legacy, if everyone does that and people look at this person and this person and this person, and I know you've said it, boy, that was a sweet lady, a good godly lady or a good godly man. I remember all of the things that they used to do, things that, you know, the Bible says we're supposed to do. Well, they were actually teaching Bible and teaching the Word of God in the way they lived their life, by their example. Psalms 119 and 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Can you be a light to someone else's path? You certainly can. By the example, by the legacy that you leave and that you build on while you're here. Have you ever gotten up in the middle of the night and... It was dark and it didn't turn the light on and tried to navigate around stuff. Ultimately, you stump your toe or run into something, don't you? You, you can't always find your way and navigate around, especially uh, if you're married to somebody that likes to change furniture all the time. Uh, makes it tough if, if you get up in the middle of the night and don't have a light. But invariably, you stumble, you run into something. But I want, I want you to look at what John has to say about, about the light. John 11, verse 9 and 10, uh, it says, Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there's no light in him. We just don't stumble physically when it's dark. We can stumble spiritually as well. You know, we can stumble spiritually, and that's worse than stumbling physically. Uh, if there's no light in our life, we live in darkness, and we're going to be forever stumbling in this life, trying to make uh, heads and tails of what we're doing and why we're here and the life we're living and what it's all for. Uh, it's so much easier to see where we're going when there's light. It's so much easier in our life to live and to live a godly life when we have the light in our life. Uh, our journey through life is light to our life if it's in God's Word. Uh, Jesus said in John 8 and verse 12, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of light. Certainly, spiritually, if you follow Jesus, you've got the light of the world. Uh, Romans 13 and 12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. We are constantly, constantly talking and telling one another and reaffirming to one another that in this life we have to make choices. You think we have to make choices every day? We do. Every day of our lives we make choices. Uh, the Bible refers to good as light, evil, or the world as darkness. We have to make a choice into how we're going to travel, how we're not going to navigate in this life. Is it going to be in the light? Is it going to be in the darkness? Uh, I want to look at a couple of passages and see if it doesn't sound like something that's going on in the world today. Isaiah 5 and 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Do you think any of that's going on in the world today? Yeah, people are doing whatever they want. They're saying it's good. They're saying it's okay. You know, they're living in a, light, in a life of darkness and then trying to proclaim it as good, as something that's good. Uh, he says, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? It don't work. We can't do that. We can't live in darkness and, and create a life of, of light. We cannot do that. It's impossible. John 3, beginning with verse 19, 
It says, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds shall be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, and his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Everything that we do in God, if it's according to His Word and according to His will, is light in our life. We can't substitute anything else for that. It has to be that. Uh, light and darkness have absolutely nothing in common. Nothing. They have nothing that's even close to the same. Second Corinthians 6 and verse 14 says... Uh, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has right, righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with dark? They have nothing in common, nothing at all. They have no union. They have no communion. It, it, there's nothing. They're the opposites. John declared in 1 John 1 and verse 5 that God is light and in Him is no darkness. If we choose God, then we choose that part that is light and that has no darkness. He said uh, uh, the blood of Christ will cleanse us from all sins. I said the, a while ago, what's, what sets us uh, different from us and God uh, about that theory of relativity, about being physical, about being spiritual, uh, God saw a need because there was a gap between mankind and between himself. And the only way that he could get the light to us for us to have was through his son. Uh, and the blood of Christ, his son, will cleanse us from all sins. It's the only way that we can even stand in the, in the presence of God is to have that light that is given and it offered through his dear son. I can't understand why it's hard uh, are such a hard decision for, for people to make in their life sometimes. First Kings, uh, Elijah speaks. Uh, he doesn't use exactly the analogy of light and darkness, but what he does do is to challenge the Israelites to make a choice. Uh, we all make choices every day. We can choose uh, to do good. We can choose to go to the light. We can choose to stay in the darkness. It's our choice. God will not ever make us do anything. He gives it and leaves it up to us. He's offered us His Son. He's offered us the light. Uh, but in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, verse 21, He says, How long will you falter between two opinions? If you love the Lord God, follow Him. If you believe in Baal, follow Him. What that tells us today is that if you believe and trust in God and want to be in the light, follow Him. If you want to remain in darkness, then remain in darkness. It's our choice. God is never going to make us do anything that we do not want to do. And today I want to extend that same challenge to you to make a decision. Either make a decision to be in the light or, or make your decision to stay in the darkness. But I'm going to tell you, God had much rather you make a decision uh, to have that light in your life. Uh, if you're not a Christian today, I certainly would hope and pray that you would want to become a Christian by uh, accepting and being obedient to the commands of God. Uh, Romans 10, 17 says we're to hear the word of God. Hebrews 11, 6 says we're to believe it. Uh, Luke 13 and 3 says we're to have that repentful heart. Romans 10 and 9 says we're to confess Christ as the Son of God. And of course, Acts 2, 38 says we're to be baptized for the remission of sin, the forgiveness of sin. Uh, God gave us His precious Son that we could be cleansed in His blood, that we could have the light in our lives. And I extend that invitation to you this morning. If you're not a Christian, I'd certainly hope that you would want to become one and, and to live your life for God. And, and if you are a Christian and maybe you've fallen away, I'd certainly hope that you would decide and declare today is the day you're going to come back home, going to come back to the light. If we can help you in any way this morning, I want you to know we're, we're praying for you and we'll just be delighted to help you if there's any way we can. And if you will, let's stand and sing this song of encouragement and use it as an invitation to the Lord. What can wash away?